baseball is dead. Rest in peace. It's a Wednesday episode. Midweek. We're all excited, Dallas. Jay, hey. Yeah. It's a big day. I feel like it's a, it's a, a pretty holiday? big day. It, it might be a holiday. I feel like uh, it's a holiday. This is a... Uh, Big news in Birdland. Big news in Birdland. Even though it's happening here in Boston. Jackson Holiday, the number one prospect in Major League Baseball. Probably this has been one of the most celebrated prospect call-ups since like Chris Bryant. Like what's what's the last prospect call-up that had this much buzz. I know we're going to say Strasburg, we'll say Harper, but Bryant happened after that, and I, I know how the career has panned out since then, but uh, I remember, like, Chris Bryant's call-up was can't miss. Jackson Holiday to me, this exceeds that. It's somewhere in the Harper Well, I feel mix. like there was, another, there was another debut that happened recently that there were a lot of folks that were excited about. That fella has quickly cooled off because of some things that have happened off the field, we mm -hmm. don't really talk about him much anymore. And that guy mm -hmm. did happen to be signed up for a decade plus to a franchise who the last time they did that was with Evan Longoria. Yeah. So I don't remember his call up being that like, can't miss though. Like obviously like you knew the name, uh, <laughs> but this one feels a bit more like universally celebrated. Well, it, it, I think it's because it feels like everybody just kind of like once you were aware that Matt Holiday was having children that were playing baseball, you're like, oh, OK, so they'll they'll just get to the big leagues at some point in time. And we can't wait for that to happen. <laughs> I, it, he's an American born son of a former all star major league baseball pitcher. Like if you are building a guy who is going to attract the maximum number of of eyeballs on his way up the ladder, Jackson Holiday is that guy. Like yeah. there have there I, I I would throw Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Yeah. as as the other name post Chris Bryant sure. into this conversation. And I think like obviously I think Vlad goes without saying Vlad was adored in a way that Matt Holiday never was. Um and I think there was fascination with the way that Vlad Jr. and his father played the similar style in which they batted and played but in terms of like uh, jackson holiday is certainly at that level in terms of hype and, and maybe exceeds it i i said the only way that his call-up the only way his call-up could have been better is if after his very first at bat in which we all know and we've talked about he was sent down to face left-handing left-handed pitching in triple a if after the first bat the first at bat they're like you know what We've seen enough. Let's pull him out of the game. Let's get him on an airplane. Let's get him to fucking Baltimore. We're good. We're good. Mm. We asked. He delivered. And now, and now he's a big leaguer. Like, that's legitimately the only way I think this could have been better because, I mean, there's a lot of talk about. And let's also remember um, what, like, uh, there's been a lot talked about, well, why the move? Why wouldn't they wait if it's about controllability? Well, it's almost like the talent now of these guys, Jay Hay almost forces the hand now of the front office because the front office could say, well, we don't want to, you know, ah, he needs to hit left-handed pitching slash the year of controllability. Well, as we all know, there's something attached to the rookie of the year that changes those things. So should Jackson Holiday wait a little while longer to get to the big leagues and everything goes well. Oh, damn. Baltimore misses what the division by a game. Or oh, unfortunately, they miss the playoffs by whatever it may be. You would then look back and go, does maybe having this more time with Jackson Holiday, could that, <laughs> could that have made a difference? That would, that would be unfortunate because when Jackson Holiday wins the rookie of the year, he will be credited for his full year of service time. The Orioles will then net a compens compensatory pick. They'll get a compensation pick because Jackson Holiday wins the rookie of the year but i think they're effectively yeah. deciding if we're gonna have to pay him and he's going to get the service time uh show of hands who'd like to capitalize on that service time everybody in the room say i i get him the fuck up here uh, okay i'm not going to talk out of both sides of my mouth and complain that the orioles didn't start the season with jackson holiday and how much of a baseball travesty that was and now also complain that they're calling him up so 
I'm going to start out by saying I, like everybody else on this podcast and everybody else in the world, is I am extremely excited that they are calling up Jackson Holiday. I am going to make that game appointment viewing for myself tonight, uh, assuming he's in the lineup, and, and I can't wait to watch his season play out. That being said, enough with this idea that there was some master fucking plan by the Baltimore <laughs> Orioles front office. Like that's that was the response that I heard when they sent him down was, well, hold on, hold on. The Orioles are loaded. It's not going to make a difference. Couple of weeks. He's going to face some left-handed pitchers and and the GM has, he's got it all figured out. Look at his track record. Okay. Okay. So we fast forward two weeks. They didn't keep him down long enough to, uh, to avoid the service time. Um, they are three games out in the AL East, which is obviously not the end of the world, but is Crazy. three games further out of the division than they started the season. Okay. Um, the players that replaced him or, or that, that were playing instead of him played poorly on the whole and some very poorly. Uh, and lastly, uh, the stated goal of him needing to face more left-handed pitching was obviously not accomplished. He faced 10 at bats, 11 plate appearances worth of left-handed pitching. There's no way, no matter how good those left-handed pitchers are, and we know they're not major league quality, Otherwise, they would be in the majors, you would think. Uh, there's no way that he got enough out of those 11 plate appearances to have made a meaningful difference in his development against left-handed pitchers. So we arrive at the conclusion that they probably should have just started him in, this, in the major leagues at the beginning of the season and that all of the talk afterwards about the reasons they were not doing so and what they hoped to accomplish ended up being, yes, maybe they, he forced their hand a little bit but not that much more than they, he forced their hand with his performance leading up to spring training and his spring training performance. Just a little bit of a farce overall, feels like. Yeah, and I think, I think that's why it's interesting to note that the front office, and because of the rules in place now, I think front offices across the game could very well find themselves should they have that hot ticket item in that prospect, the, you know, the Jackson Holiday type talent. Do we... Do we just say to hell with it? And does he break camp with the team or do we try to play it safe and see how he adjusts over the first month or so? Will we be in a spot where we're still competitive and we can kind of still, you know, not have to call this individual up? What I think this also speaks to is the impact that they believe that Jackson holiday could have, because like you just laid out, Jay, they are not winning the division right now, or they're not in the lead in the division. The supplementary pieces did not pan out the way they had hoped they would. They were not enough to buy them enough time until Jackson Holiday's time was bought, if you will, by the franchise. And so they said, all right, we're, we're quite literally in the spot that we did not want to be in when it comes to did he break camp and when will he arrive? And the fact that if he wins rookie of the year, we're still going to get it's that just... pick, but we would like to have his time here because He's going to get a full year of service time if he wins that. What are we doing? And, and none of this is a conversation if teams were just willing to pay these people what they were ultimately worth at the time that they were worth it down the road with Jackson Holiday. Like we went through all of this nonsense and they've dug themselves this deficit in part because they were trying to play financial games with the guy who's very likely to be the most important, all due respect to Adley. I think probably the most important player on their franchise over the next half decade or so, uh, if they are actually going to be a great World Series caliber team. Uh, I know nonsense. we're getting ahead of ourselves here because Jackson Holiday hasn't played a major league game yet, but do the Orioles have the best spine in baseball? I Jeez, feel like they, they have to. I mean, Are like even like Cedric Mullins, as their center fielder, like he's not part of that young, exciting core, but he's an all star. He's a really good player. So you're going Adley with Gunner and Jackson Holiday with Cedric Mullins as the spine of your team. Is there a better spine in baseball? I mean, it's pretty strong right now. That is pretty, pretty strong right now. I mean, I don't think there is one. Cer certainly, if you're looking for a spine that's likely to get stronger over the yeah. next couple of seasons, too. 
as opposed to spines that you know are already at their peak. I, I think I think you can go a step further with that question, particularly with the non Mullins portion of that, and say, uh, where does this rank among like recent spine building blocks in major league history? Like wild card era, last fifteen years, last twenty years, whatever it is, like maybe and maybe that's a question more for next podcast or something like that or 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 maybe for a YouTube video. Mm. Um but it's I, I think their ceilings and their floors, like as good as Gunner and Adley have already established themselves to be, I think that's kind of the the appropriately aggressive question. Like it it could be as good as we've seen in in, in quite some time. Yeah. I'm very excited about it. Um, uh, I'm very excited, and this is a point that Jay Hayes made before, that they're on the East Coast. We get to watch them. We get to. We don't have to stay up late to to watch this Orioles team. Um, to get you know uh, a a lineup where you're probably gonna. I, I don't know where where would you because Gunnar Henderson's already like leading off, and you got Adley hitting second. Like, where would you slot Jackson? Hall? Like, are you throwing him to the fire as a teenager? Like, what what are we doing here with Jackson Holiday in terms of the lineup? Because, like, yeah, like you, I understand when you call a guy up, you want him to get acclimated to the league. You don't want to expect too much. You don't want to put too much pressure on the kid. Um, but these young Orioles, I mean, it's not like it's not like they're batting their rookies down the lineup they're just like hey you're here we need you let's go how long before jackson holiday is a middle of the order bat for baltimore well i think that will remain to be seen um i I think what you probably try to do initially is you try to find a a soft landing spot or as soft of a landing spot as you can for him and there's probably places where you might be able to go and and feel like you're going to get him some pitches to hit because the question I think you're asking is how long does it take before Jackson Holiday becomes somebody that could potentially provide said protection for somebody else in that lineup? And that's going to have to be because he has done a good job of making the adjustments to this level and making the adjustments as they come to him. So until he shows that group that he can handle that responsibility of being a 20 year old stalwart, a 20 year old meat and potatoes big league type of guy until that happens. And and obviously we're not saying that that won't happen. I think we all believe that that will happen until that day comes though. I think you do have to find some soft landing spots for him in areas where he, where he will be protected and also areas where he won't feel like he has to come up and do all of the heavy lifting right away. Cause that's one of the last things you want him to have to feel right is I'm 20 and I'm now here. What am I? Am I this savior? No, that's not the storyline here. The storyline is he's joining a group, as we've just outlined, that has a really good chance to be really good for a really long time altogether. Like when you look at these young birds here in Baltimore, uh, I don't want to I don't want this to come across as a negative. It's not. Um, It's more kind of just like a profiling question more. But who's who is the cornerstone bat here? Like who's the guy like when you talk about lineup protection? Who's protecting who? Because it feels to me, and maybe this isn't the best way to say it, it feels like they're all protectors. Like, who's the number three hitter where it's like, I'm going to uh, hit 35 home runs. I'm going to have a 900 OPS. I need someone hitting behind me to protect me. It feels like they're all the guy that's hitting behind the guy. I, I My take on this is that it, it goes back to what you we were talking about just moments ago about the spine and that w- what makes this trio unique is that they are foundation players at generally important defensive demanding defensive positions and so what you will probably or maybe not have is your in your mind your traditional 40 home run 120 RBI 950 OPS player year in and year out if one of those guys becomes that, they are the MVP of baseball. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is, and they may be that, they may become those without those sorts of seasons, but like, I think you're more likely to see between those guys a lot of seasons of somewhere between 20 and 30 20. homers mm-hmm. um, and like eight to eight, a, 50. A, an incredibly well rounded contribution in most phases of the game, base running, defensive, 
contributions, on base percentage, uh, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, bat to ball uh, in most cases, and you know maybe those guys exceed that. And then what you're talking about is, as we've said, you know, a potential face of the league sort of guy. Yeah. But I I, I think all three of those guys may be. I think you're you're onto something. I just think like where they're playing on defense needs to be factored into like what their offensive profile is going to look like. Yeah. Well, I, this, this is a lineup that becomes like, deep. Yes. Yeah. It's a good problem this to have because now like, uh, yes, you, the, the lineup becomes much lengthier and you may not have that one 950 OPS guy, but out the gate, you're getting hit with like four or five fucking 820 OPS guys. And you like to see well, that. And, and that's some that's, of the younger guys we're talking about. It's like we we love the younger guys, but let's not forget about the Mount Castles, the Santanders. Like he can pop you thirty. Like that's where you start to get into the length in the Cedric Mullins. It's like hey, like we're here too. Like we were here. We're we're still pretty good. I know everyone's focused on the the young players, but when you combine all that, what you get is a lineup that can hurt you seven eight guys deep. But and, and what they also you know we're talking about the spine. What their elite farm system also includes is some of those more traditional corner guys who could end up being maybe not 40 homer, but like slug first type of play like uh, Kerstad, the outfielder uh, corner guy, Kobe Mayo, like, yeah, like those guys, I I think um, might fit that power first profile who would fit in the, you know maybe four maybe six maybe five spots in the lineup so that's what what makes this such an incredible situation and why to your original question i think jackson holiday is going to start his career uh towards the bottom of the lineup when these and these are guys that these are guys i think that start to fit the bill more so of the ball player that we've been talking about making a resurgence as opposed to what that 950 plus OPS bopper looks like. I think we can understand what that guy brings to the table defensively at times. And if it's anything above average, that's where we're starting to talk superstar. But to think about guys who can move around on the base path, think about guys who are going to be banging the gaps, beating the gaps down with double power. They've got the ability to pop the ball to all fields as well. This is a new wave of lineup complexion, in my opinion, because there's the Bobby more Witt than Jr. one dude. Effect. Yeah, well, and it's it's and you have like conceivably in this lineup, it feels like you have multiple guys who could grow into something similar to a Bobby Witt Jr. While the Kansas City Royals have made the one guy that they have their centerpiece, understandably so. This is a team that appears to have multiple individuals who could grow into some form of BWJ, and that's fucking scary. That right. is scary. Right, because while we sit here and ask, like, who's the cornerstone bat of all this? If you told me right now, hey, like, we're not going to get you. Uh, uh, I don't even know who it would be. I mean, like, Mike Trout is just the cliche answer. But the, the, the season that he's having right now, he's, you know, he's yeah. going to have another offensive juggernaut season for Mike Trout. You don't have like the, the, the slug guy, the home run guy, the RBI guy. But what if I told you you could field a team of five Bobby Witt Juniors? Then you're just like, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Dallas, for you, uh, because, you know, Jay Hay brought up the point about Vladdy Jr. And what was cool for all baseball fans when we saw the debut of Vladimir Guerrero Jr. was like, man, I remember, you know, watching Vlad Guerrero Sr. at the Home Run Derby and seeing that little pudgy kid, Vladdy Jr., was just like bopping around during the all-star weekend and it's cool to see he grew up to become uh, a, a dude that hit 40 bombs in the big leagues. So, I mean, Jackson holiday, I don't like, I don't have memories of seeing Jackson holiday around. Cause like Matt holiday, all, he was an all-star, but he wasn't like a guy that everyone sort of focused on even when he, when he was at the top of his game, but you played with them. Um, so you personally got to see Jackson holiday as a kid. Like you probably have memories of that. How, oh yeah, it's not weird, but like, is it weird? Like, how weird is it? I guess to see like that's the kid that would like play video games on my phone is now the top prospect in baseball. That's the call up that everyone's celebrating today. Oh, it's hilarious! And uh, like I said, another layer to that. I legitimately like, and I I fucking texted Maddie when I did this too. Um, I mean, I drafted him in our fantasy league, <laughs> and he was in the minor leagues, right? Yeah. And I'm not the only one to do that. I'm not, you know, it's not like I'm some fucking genius. Um. 
But yeah, it, it, it's just, and you could see it right away. Like you it, look, and first of all, the holiday family, they are an incredible family, just an inc- incredibly close, tight knit, just a group of amazing human beings. And Matt is an incredible father. And you could tell he was that then. So just to watch him spend the time, but to watch those little guys out there running around, screwing around, throwing balls, hitting balls. And then, you know, like I said, getting on the bus, it was one of the cool things. Cause I knew, um, you know, getting on the bus, if, if Matt had his kids there, if he had the boys there, I, w- I was going to have fun. You know, I, here I am a fucking 24, 25 year old big leaguer looking forward to getting on the bus and playing fucking fishing video games with my teammates kid. That's where I was at mentally <laughs> at yeah. that time. But yeah, it's me and Jackson in the back of the bus trying to catch fucking Marlin on my deep sea fishing game. And now here he is like the face of the new wave of baseball. And it's dude, it's, um, yeah, it is. It's just really surreal to think that, you know, 15, 20 plus years ago, this is where it was at. This is how, and now, th- and now this is where we're at. 20 years later, that dude is going to be making his big league debut. And he has got the interest of the baseball world locked in. I feel like we we can't move on from the Jackson Holiday segment without acknowledging bus or only. Um, wouldn't you agree that it's a it's the right thing to do here to acknowledge Buster who tweeted in November of 2013, so over 10 years ago now, on November 14, 2013, Buster only tweeted Matt Holiday's son, future All Star. He hasn't achieved that yet, but he is the the top prospect in baseball who's making his big league debut today, who everyone is excited about, whether you're an Orioles fan or not. So that's a pretty good call. Yeah. And someone even tweeted him and said, a little early to say that, isn't it? And he said, yeah, I've seen him hit. I'll stand by the tweet. Yeah, he was how old was he at the time? Five? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, he must have been what, nine? Yeah, if that I'm, I'm I'm not fucking around. Like legitimately, he was. Yeah, he's like yeah, he's like eight. Yeah, ten years ago and change. Yeah, he's twenty. He turned twenty in December, so he was ten. Yeah. <laughs> Congrats to Jackson, <laughs> Matt, and Buster. Yeah, and Buster, and Buster. <clears throat> uh, before the call up, um, Jackson Holiday for triple triple A Norfolk. Was hitting 333 with a 482 on base. He was slugging 595 for a 1077 OPS. Had the two home runs, of course, the first one in his first at bat of the year. Drove in nine, swiped a bag, walked 12 times. So that's going to be important when we look at this Baltimore Orioles lineup. Um, Gunner, and don't, and, and, Adley, and let's- you know, Mount Castle. Uh, They've got dudes that can get on base, and um, I know that we're excited to see the first double, the first homer, the first knock, but Jackson Holiday is going to get on base any way he can. That's going to be the, the well, impact that he makes. And I think it's fitting that we've talked about Vlad Guerrero. We'll throw another name out there, the Acunas. Don't, don't forget, don't forget, if you're into holidays, there's another holiday coming too. Mm. That's right. He's got a little brother, Ethan. And that kid fucking rakes too. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's gonna be a holiday for a minute in the big leagues, baby. Sure is. I've I've also been keeping an eye on Jackson Holiday's son. <laughs> and he's one yeah, he's one, and I think he's going to be an all star. <laughs> he's one. <laughs> just just want to get out in front of that right now. You heard it here. Flag planted. I don't even yeah. actually know if he has kids, but probably not. But he might not, not. quite yet. But if he does, can't wait to see them. Preemptively calling an all star. The in the 2041 all star game in Sacramento, California. <clears throat> That'll be the day. Uh, on a down Dallas note, holiday named after Dallas Braden. Woo! Ho- Co host of Baseball's Dead. Yep. Great guy. You know him, you love him. Um, uh, on a down note here, Trevor Story's done for the year, Jake. Oh. Shut up, Dallas. I'm talking to Jake. Um, <laughs> this is uh, it's a blow to the Sox, who started off seven and three. Um, 
I think a lot of people probably stood there and said, well, look at the competition. They played the shitty ass Oakland A's. Uh, they played the the weak Seattle Mariners lineup and uh, the Angels. I mean, but like these teams, like the A's, didn't they just take a series from the Tigers? Everyone's been sucking their yeah. dick. The yeah, that Angels, just happened. Yeah. So, I mean, the competition is what it is, but um, also ready to take a series from the defending world champs. Just wanted to throw that out there, too. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Go yeah there you go. Uh, but this is uh, this is Trevor's story. It was uh, some pretty heartbreaking shit. Oh, man, I don't want to hear this. Yeah, yeah. You know, I knew it was, I knew it was bad. Um, you know, in the moment, just because I, you know, I heard it come out, and uh, you know, heard some other things too. Um, and just the pain I felt was, uh, you know, I had never felt anything like that. So, um, but you know, you always try to be optimistic and. Just hope that, you know, it went out and came back in and, you know, try to, you know, make the best out of the situation. But obviously, you know, some other things happened and it was more serious um, than we had hoped for. So, um, yeah, just it's hard to hard to imagine, really. How tough was it when you seemed to be in such a great place coming out of spring training? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, um, you know, missing last season, you you feel that, you know, you, you miss your teammates, you miss playing the game. Um, <sighs> you just know what it takes, you know. Oh. But I'll be all right. Trevor, your emotions right now, is it partly because you feel this is a special group or is it kind of compounded by what's gone on the last three years for you? Yeah, just all of it, you know. Um, I know we have a special group. Um, we got off to a good start, you know. Um, and, yeah, just the frustration of – you know, battling kind of this, this this injury thing over the last few years. And, um, you know, it's something I, you know, I've hung my hat on in my career is being able to play post. But, uh, you know, that hasn't been the case, you know, last couple of years. But, uh I just love this game, man. <laughs> I uh, put my heart and soul into it. Um, I just, uh, I just feel bad. How much will this drive? So, I mean, it's 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 fucking awful to hear the pain in this man's voice. Uh, That's tough to listen to, man. Yeah, I mean, like fucking listen to the the guy signed a contract to come to Boston to win. Um, and he talks about how, you know, like I pride myself on being a guy that's been able to play all the time. And then I come here and it hasn't gone that way. And I think you it's very reminiscent of kind of what happened with Chris Sale and what he talked about and how uh, the mental struggles that come along with the physical struggles, especially when it's compounded with uh, a big money contract with Chris Sale. You know, he was traded to Boston had one of the best seasons of his entire career in his first year, won the World Series in the second year. Um, and then after that, once he signed the extension, it was just injury after injury after injury. And it was tough luck injuries. Like I, you know, when when you have a guy that it's like you can tell he's not conditioned and it's like, oh, there goes the hammy or or whatever. It's like, man, like if only you probably took better care of your body, then we wouldn't be here. With Chris Sale, the dude had a fucking line drive smoked off his hand, you know, falling off the bicycle. We don't know if that's true or not, but it was a lot of like tough luck injuries. It wasn't like a conditioning thing. With Trevor Story, it's the same thing. I mean, the dude dove for a ball. Um, I think, you know, the offense hasn't been what it was in Colorado, but he all he was doing was going all out defensively because he knows, hey, if I can't hit, I know I can contribute defensively at a position that the Red Sox really need some help here at shortstop. Uh, and he ends up dislocating, breaking his shoulder, and he's done for the year after nine games. And you can hear it in his voice. Obviously, he was getting emotional. Um, 
that it's it's all one thing after the other. It's not just I'm out for the year. It's the fact that one sec, the second I got here, I wasn't able to contribute to anything. Like I, I have not been a, a net positive for this organization that committed the the dollars and the years to me and my career. And here we go again. It's it, it's not it's not like last year when it was hey when it, when Trevor Story comes back now we get going. All we got to do is tread water until Trevor Story comes back and now we go. Uh, this time around, it's he had the first healthy spring training because he had the elbow surgery. Uh, it, like there was just things that threw. I think he his wife had a baby the first spring training with Boston. Then it was the elbow surgery. So this was his first healthy spring training, looked good, was playing well, and then this happens. And it's just you feel you feel cursed like like with Chris Sale. It was just one thing after another and it's it's now it's this with Trevor Story. So it just sucks. This is This is why they say the injuries like the <laughs> the injuries are clearly physical, but you find out very quickly that it is the mental aspect of dealing with the physical inability to do what you do. That is the challenge because as an athlete, you'll get up and physically do what you can. You'll even get up and physically do shit when you can't do it. That's just what you've trained your body to do. But then there comes a point in time where that can't happen any longer. And so now it's the mental, it's, it's the mental just, uh, it's not even, it's not even a grind. I mean, it is a, you feel like you fall into a void. You have lost your identity. What do I do? And you, you question your whole existence. And you can hear it in this dude's... That's why I said it's super hard to listen to because for, for all the talk about whether guys are pissed off about just not being able to play, oh, he's happy, he's got his money, he's blah, blah, blah. Like th- You can tell. Like This is a dude who... And correct me if I'm wrong, Jared, but isn't this a dude who <clears throat> sort, of, uh, sort of started like shortstop university? Kind of yes. like, yeah, uh, yeah. kind of like in, tight end you that uh, he, George he Kittle said, and Kelsey and Greg Olson threw together. It's him and Tulo, right? Didn't they get together? He said and, Tulo or, did it for the Rockies players when they were younger, and he was a part uh, of Tulo's camp. And now he yeah. felt like he wanted to carry it on with the Red Sox. Now that he's a veteran guy, yeah. And that's that's who this dude is. That's who this dude is. That's who a lot of these players are. That's who damn near I'd want to say just about ninety percent of these guys are. That. And he he's that dude that it, the reason it breaks my heart personally is because you can tell he's a guy. How how Jared? I've been talking about the two different types of athletes since the day I fucked since the day we met. The dude who gets breaded up and says, "Let's fucking go." Now it's time to roll. Now we go. Or there's the dude who gets breaded up and is like, "Oh, well, that's why I worked hard." So, well, that happened, and oh, you know, damn back hurts, whatever. Maybe I'll get him next year. Oh, leg hurt. No, I can't do it. You know, maybe we'll get him next year. Like that is not who Trevor Story is. Trevor Story is the first dude. You paid me. Well, guess what? I'd now like to take every guy that you could foresee as being an impactful position player in my realm. I want to, I want to bring them out to the pad. We're going to grind. We're going to create a culture. We're just going to start doing things a certain way here, because if I'm going to be here for this long, there's a good chance that I'm going to be with these guys. And I want them to have an idea of how we're going to go about it. That's who Trevor Story is. And that's why this fucking just guts you. Yep. Yep. Jay, any thoughts? I mean, of course, obviously, I had a stat about how he hasn't been very good offensively for the Red Sox, but that seems not particularly helpful or appropriate at this time. Um, I will say, I mean, to the point about shortstop you. All the indications were is that the guy could, even when his offense was down, was still picking it and was still like a, uh, a, a net positive defensively for the, it, during his Red Sox tenure. So like <clears throat> you could say, oh, well, how hard is that bat going to be re- to replace? What were their expectations really for offense out of shortstop? But he was bringing more than that. I think he was bringing a certain competency level at defense that um, will probably will probably be on a certain level hard to replace, uh, harder to replace than his offense. Uh, even though I think to the casual fan, I I think Trevor Story is maybe still more associated with his offensive peak during Colorado. Um, but has been probably a better defensive asset for a number of years now. So I guess that's what I I would add. Yeah, Jake, where are we at on losing Trevor Story? 
Yeah, I mean, it's heartbreaking. Um, I think fans are obviously frust- frustrated because of uh, he hasn't posted for the majority of his tenure, but I don't know how you listen to that video and think anything other than he wants to be out there every day. So just sucks, and uh, I don't know if there's really much else to say about it. Yeah, sucks. It continued to suck yesterday. Uh, Nick Pavetta on the injured list with a right elbow flexor strain. I mean, the Red Sox kind of went into this season with very low expectations. But if they were going to be interesting or contend for a wild card spot, it was going to be on the backs of those two guys at the top of the rotation taking on the bulk of the, the innings, Lucas Giolito who's done for the year and Nick Pavetta, who, I mean, Craig Breslow called it a mild um, elbow flexor strain. I mean, it's still not great when we're talking about the elbow. Uh, remember, a dude remember what strain means. Remember what strain means. Jared. Mild what tear. Strain mean? It's a tear. There you go. Yeah. So uh, that's not good. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just like, you know, Red Sox fans, like, I get it. We're a big market team. No one feels bad for us, but fucking you should. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> but please do. But, please do. I mean, I will I will double down and reiterate what I've already said. Since 2010, no fan base has sat through more last place seasons than the Boston Red Sox. Like, mm. we've seen Sucks the worst baseball. Suck. It's like, I get it. You know, we've we, we've won. Two World Series titles in that span, but we've also sat through far more dog shit than fun times. Like, I get it. Yeah, the the, the top is the top, but the bottom has been the bottom. Like, our best players, the highest paid players on the team, uh, they don't play. <laughs> you know, like, if, if we're going to go out there and do it, then you need those guys to be healthy. And they haven't been for a long time. You know, like luckily there's been nothing knock on wood catastrophic has happened to Rafael Devers other than his watching him play third base. But, you know, I feel like that's where you kind of get into the not to have like a section 10 tangent here, but that's where you get into the roster flexibility and how the Masataka Yoshida signing has kind of fucked us a little bit because. I mean, ideally, and Coley made this point like Devers is a DH. He's not a good defensive third baseman. And you paid him the thirty million dollars a year to hit. Like part part of that thirty million is not not to play defense at third base. We know that. Like this is not just like a a hiccup in his in his defensive prowess. He's he's not a good defensive third baseman. He should be DHing more than he's playing third base. But you can't do that because you signed Yoshida for fucking ninety million dollars over four years or five years, um, and he he can't play defense either. So I don't know. Are you are you calling for the benching of of Devers right now? No, I'm I'm calling for the the eventual move to DH to happen maybe sooner than expected. You want Yoshida now? Now you want Yoshida traded for for more salary relief? Is that what I'm hearing? No, probably more for roster flexibility. I Dallas Man. is trolling aside. Uh, the I mean, listen, the the Pavetta news. Trevor Story is a much bigger name. To, to baseball fans, I think Nick Pavetta is a much more devastating injury for the Red Sox. Uh, yes. More devastating than Lucas Giolito, even all due respect to him. Um, I mean, we are talking about a guy who since July 1st of last season, um, you know, when he kind of transitioned, not completely full time to the rotation, but primarily to the rotation from that point forward, has been one of the very best pitchers in the American League, not in the not for the Red Sox, not in the AL East. In the entire AL uh, since July one, uh, opponents are hitting 194. That's the fourth best mark in the AL. 35.3 percent strikeout rate. That's the best. You couple that with the 11th lowest walk rate, and you have the best K to walk percentage uh, and the seventh lowest ERA at 2.98. So, whatever to to, to whatever weight you're willing to give about 90 something innings, which is what. Uh, he's at over that stretch, which is a decent amount of innings. Um, th- this was a frontline starting pitcher that the Red Sox lost and is, I mean, I, it feels like every podcast we're talking about, wow, what a devastating blow that pitcher's lost is to that rotation. Yeah. Um, Pavetta's right up there. Um, he's not the name of Cole or Strider, but in terms of his importance to his team, 
and the ways that the Red Sox can replace his production, damn close. Yeah. Yeah, that's brutal. It's just a brutal time for the Sox, right? Hang, hang in there. So on Rafael extension, though. Which, okay, so <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you've emptied the tank on this, right? I mean, yeah, we didn't like go super hard on it because it was more I mean, now like the 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 Sedan Rafaela conversation to me is far more interesting talking about moving him from center to short than it is like, all right, cool, you bought out a couple of years of free agency. Um, I yeah. didn't necessarily right now expect him to be one of the guys that it's like, man, if you don't lock him up right now, he's gonna cost you fucking two hundred fifty million dollars later. Like, I don't feel that way in this moment. Um but yeah, that's kind of one of your internal options is to make him your everyday shortstop now yeah i i'll make it i'll make it brief i because it is still a little bit interesting to me that they locked him up i i I think i have joined red sox fans and being critical of the front office and i know a 50 million what was it eight and 50 yeah a 50 million dollar pre-arb buying out outlay of of dollars is not necessarily an indication that the front office or ownership is moving in a direction that they weren't previously, but I do think, you know, tip of the cap for, yeah, maybe he's not a guy that was eventually going to cost you $250 million, but I think with his level of defensive impact, that's like already established in the major leagues and, uh, and which follows, uh, what looked re- like a really promising defensive trajectory in the minor leagues. Like he doesn't really have to get any better offensively for this contract to be a good return for the team and if he and if he turns into like you know i I saw a reference to like developing into kevin kiermeyer offensively if he if he develops into kevin kiermeyer offensively then all of a sudden you have like one of the 10 or 15 best contracts team side in the game given his defensive impact in center field so i just uh you know i i don't spend a ton of time thinking about sadan rafaela but i thought that that was a nice bit of work by the Red Sox front office. Yeah. And then it immediately becomes that, you know, we we love his defense in center field. He's actually like won the Red Sox maybe arguably two games with his defense yeah. in center field only sure oh, did. Yeah, against the A's. Yeah. Son of a uh, bitch. Yeah. Legolier's uh, fucking crushed a ball and Duran, I'm like, oh, this is great. This is great. Duran's out of the game. This is fabulous. Because that guy <laughs> yeah, that guy that guy's really fun to watch. But this fucking dude just got on his horse, and I was like, there's no way. You, you just watched a human outrun a baseball. I mm-hmm. was like, that's, un, that's unfair. That yeah. is not cool. All that to potentially move him to shortstop because of this Trevor Story injury. So it is raining shit here in Boston. Catch the fever. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of raining shit, though, Dallas. Your Pittsburgh Pirates. What what about my Pittsburgh Pirates? Um, little David Bednar action yeah. going on. Yeah, that's that's, that's um, okay. That's okay. No, Look, uh, we it, we can it, move. Let, let me let me provide the context. Let me provide the context, <laughs> and then you can go on your fucking uh, propaganda smear campaign. Um, David Bednar has now blown three saves already. Uh, we're like two weeks into the season. He's blown three saves, and his last time out, he only recorded one out, but he did give up three hits four earned runs to get that third blown save. Um, I don't want to say I, I, I have nothing but love and respect and admiration for Pittsburgh Pirates fans, but they did boo Mm -hmm. Bednar after he blew his third save, which Mm -hmm. to me, I didn't love it. Mm -hmm. I didn't love it. And neither Mm -hmm. Did Rowdy Did tell us? Uh, this is the pride of Pittsburgh to everybody. We don't do that out here. Uh, we're a good team. We're winning for a reason. Uh, we're going to get our man back on track. But what happened today is, uh, I think, unacceptable. And we as a group in Pittsburgh got to be better. It's an all-star for a reason. And uh, we just have to be better. So that being said, <laughs> two-time all-star. David, I know it's a little emotional. What does it mean to have your guys like that behind you right now? No, it's huge. Obviously, there's uh, peaks and valleys for every season. And, uh, you know, we're going to get over this. It's, it's definitely tough. But, you know, seeing these guys have my back, it's, it's, uh, it's huge. Dallas, your thoughts? Love it. Love it. 
And I love the fact that it comes from a guy who it's not like Rowdy Telez has been in Pittsburgh for the last nine years. Right. But I think it's a guy who's been around and he's been around <clears throat> some, some leaders who have probably showed him what you got to do when something like this happens. And especially if it happens early, what needs to be done? Well, you kind of, you close ranks, you close the circle a bit. You let everybody in the room know that we're all pulling in the same direction. Let's not lose sight of that here. But then you tell the folks publicly too, like, Hey, <clears throat> we've got a good mix going. We've, we've, we're going to be good. We're going to be all right here, but you got to let this kind of, you got to let this play out. You got to let us play baseball. And this is part of playing baseball is sometimes things don't go well for the guys you hopefully look to lean on throughout the, throughout the entire season. So I love the fact that it came from Rowdy for that reason. Uh, it's not, it's not like I can speak for the, uh, speak for the Pittsburgh fan base, but what I'd like to believe is that they understand that there is a great opportunity to rally behind this group right now, as opposed to getting so frustrated so early and ready to crumble up the season and throw it away. And I, I've heard a lot of talk. Well, we started out great last year. Everything was great. 20 and eight. Look what happened. Look what happened. Okay. Okay. But I think things just look and feel a little different. And so I'm, I am here for the, Hey, can we fuck? Can we get on the same ship and head in the same direction together? And I love that. I, I love that Rowdy was the one who said it. Yeah. Is it is it a good thing or a bad thing that their expectations are where they appear to be? Well, that's where that's where. And look, I've talked to a lot of folks <clears throat> familiar with the organization, and I think it's a combination of both. Of like, hey, no, 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 we're frustrated because we have these expectations, and we want them to know that we have these expectations. Um, and that's fair. That's totally understandable, right? Like, all right, boys, it's a great year. We're off to a good start. None of this, uh, none of this, uh, let's just fall to the 500 wayside and be okay with it. You know, there's none of that. And it's also, uh, again, I think a combination of, we don't want that to be, we don't want this to be a, a thought. We don't want this to be something that builds and snowballs. Like let's, let's, let's shut that down right now because we are a good team and we do like what we have going on right now. So you almost hope that it's a, it's a Philadelphia Trey Turner situation, like where it's just the fans wrap their arms around the whole team and they're like, all right, hey, you know what? You're right. Bednar, he's a dude. He's a dude. He's our they're, dude. They're trying Two-time to Two-time all-star led the fucking league in saves last year. Like, let's not forget this. They're trying to do that in Boston right now and it's really pissing me off. <clears throat> what? Trying to... Jaron Duran dropped a fly ball yesterday and it led to run scoring. And like there was a reporter that tweeted out that he like punched his locker and said that like I suck and blah, blah. And like, it's my fault. He's being accountable. And obviously he's pissed that he made a bad play. But now like Red Sox fans are like, we got to do a standing ovation. It's like he's hitting 370 with like an OPS over a thousand. Like we <laughs> save the fucking standing ovation for a dude that's like really dragging ass and struggling. and like. He's one of the most beloved players. Like, it's not like he didn't get booed. Like, I think Duran himself, if I asked him, like, hey, do you think that's a little over the top? He would be like, yeah, like, I'm a meathead. I pulled a nutty in the, like, and then I went home and I was fine. <laughs> like, you know? Yeah. So, like, I feel yeah. like that we, everyone saw the Trey Turner thing work and they're like, all right, standing ovation, standing ovation. Like, no, like, come on. Yeah. And I, and I, and I also think that just hearing this message come from the room should hopefully show Pittsburgh fans like, yo, they feel like they're good. They're, this is not a this is not a fluke. They feel like they have something that they can sustain. So, you know, just understand that it's early, and I think getting off to the hot start has you thirsting for every W you can get because of how last year started and because of how last year ended. So that's why when when you see wins in front of you that just go away, you get you get angry. Yeah. You get angry, especially if you haven't had a ton of success. Specific to Bednar, though, like it's hard not to draw a line between him missing the vast majority of spring training with that right lat soreness and only getting two outings in in spring training and his current struggles. Like I know Shelton came out and said that he is healthy, and I'm not here to cast any doubt on Derek Shelton's. Uh, 
view on that, but it him being healthy and him being in a groove and prepared and a, at his normal routine or, or preparation level pitching wise are two different things, uh, as Dallas could obviously and has told us before. Um, and you know, they're attributing it to, to, to command issues, uh, citing like, you know, he hit, he fucking hit a dude with his curveball. Um, I looked his whiff rate with his curveball. I know it's only 20 something pitches, but his whiff rate with his curveball is a third of what it was last year, uh, when it was an out pitch for him. So like, uh, he- healthy, not healthy, uh, not fully prepared for the season physically, uh, whatever, like it seems connected. Uh, to me, at least in some direct or indirect way. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think there's any question. Yeah, hang with him. Velocity's still there. Yeah, he'll be fine. He'll be- yeah. it. Oh no 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 no. Yeah, that's no, for the no. fans. That's for the fans who booed Bednar. <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah, you got to serve both sides of the Pirates fan base here, at Dallas. They're not all fucking raise it types. Yeah, that's uh, true. Uh, that's it. That's Some of them are lower at times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tyler Glass now, my guy, the sex god, tied a career high with 14 strikeouts in Minnesota against the Twins. Seven innings, three hits, zero earned runs, zero walks. Of course, the 14 strikeouts. It's the most strikeouts ever by a pitcher who threw fewer than 90 pitches in and outing um justin havens uh what were your impressions of tyler glasnow last night just going out there and doing it thank you for coming to me first uh every every night or afternoon when i'm settling in to watch baseball i like to pick pick one premier game you know one that's going to get center stage in my viewing Mm -hmm. and twins dodgers was that game so i was fortunate enough to watch every basically every pitch of Tyler Glasnow's performance yesterday. And it was obvious from the start that it was going to be utterly dominant. And I'm so glad that he finished it as such. Uh, it was great to look up, uh, you know, nuggets on it or whatever, obviously that you had the, uh, the number of pitches nugget, uh, as well. Um, you know, he had 21 whiffs. So we're basically talking about the same number of swing and misses as, uh, Ronel Blanco got in the no hitter, um, and, and only seven innings pitched. Uh, and he's the first Dodgers pitcher with a start of 14 plus strikeouts, zero runs and zero walks since Kershaw in 2016. And he's the first righty to do so since Brad Penny in 2007. Throwback wow. name, throwback outing. Um, mm-hmm. But no, it was awesome. I mean, this is everything you imagine when you have Tyler Glass now reaching his full potential in your head. It was last night. It was that performance. Um, you know, the he was spinning it the va- the he was challenging people in the zone with the fastball it was just everything you could ask for uh and it was a pleasure to watch 21 swing and misses 44 <laughs> total swings it's a good ratio right uh when they swing and miss and just about half the shit you're throwing up there jay hey yep fair assessment my friend <laughs> fair assessment i mean that is just uh like you don't even see half the shit that's coming out of his hand that's yeah. it. That's this is what you you're absolutely right when you say that this is what you expected from Tyler Glass. Now, this is the arrival. Now, I think you just start to you start to ask for it to be as efficient every time out, more efficient every time out. I, <clears throat> that was right? part I of th- what made it so awesome, though. Sure. Right? Was that sure? I know yes. you're not saying otherwise, but like mm-hmm. 88 pitches and 14 strikeouts and zero walks is like. And that's, that, I mean, book me that obviously sign me up for that viewing experience every single time all day, because that's what you want. The, uh, I mean, and isn't it funny that we're at the we're at the point in having the conversations that we're having about, you know, controlling workloads or how to manage workloads and how do we keep pitchers healthy? And we're talking about ripping it 100 times at, you know, X amount of torque and blah, 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 and what that could mean. And now here we are. We're talking about this is what we want to see. From Tyler Glasnow, we want to see him seven innings, eight innings, getting deep into these ball games and dominating these types of ball games because he has the stuff to dominate like this every time he takes the mound. Every single time he takes the mound, and and what's crazy to think is there's a growing number of guys with his 
type of stuff, or I should actually say, because there's guys who have better stuff. There's guy, there's more guys like him and stuff like this. We're going to continue to see come out, but it's so awesome to watch a guy like Glasnow who's had the expectations, I think, start to start to close the gap and meet those on a more consistent basis. I think it also just kind of sucks when you talk about um, any pitcher, specifically him, but any pitcher. Get off to a start like this, see a start like that, and be like, well, if he can just stay healthy, I mean, we can say that about anybody. Like, we look at Tyler Glasnow's track record in terms of workload and innings pitched over the course of a full season. Um, he just hasn't done it. Like, he can do it well when, he, when he's out there, but he's one of those guys that kind of has to prove, like, hey, I can go... Like what? What's the golden mark right here? 160 innings. Like, would you be happy with 160? I, yeah. I would be happy with that. I'd be very yeah. happy with that. Like, that would be yes. a career. Like, we're not talking about 200 innings anymore as like a full workload for a starting pitcher. But if I can get 160 innings out of Glass now this year, I'd be very, very happy. But it just kind of sucks that you know when you talk about someone that their career high in innings is around like 120 innings or whatever. Uh, it's like, all right, well, yeah, well, he just has to stay healthy, and then we'll see what it looks like at the end. You have to say that about anybody like we like who would have thought that if we had a conversation about Garrett Cole, who is constantly in the Cy Young conversation, who never had a, a real major injury, just goes out there and compiles innings like quality innings that we had to preface a Garrett Cole Cy Young repeat by saying, well, if he stays healthy, like when have we ever had to say that about Garrett Cole? And then now he's he's out for two months minimum. Um, I just, I don't know. I hate that. I hate having to like, I would rather just have the conversation about a guy like Tyler Glasnow and say, we know this shit is good. We know that he's got swing and miss like, like no, like nobody else from a starting pitcher perspective. Uh, if he can just maintain this performance, I don't want to talk about maintain health, but you can't have a conversation about a pitcher without well, talking about it. Not today. Not today. You can't. And, and it's almost, <clears throat> and this is where you get into the, like, are, are we just, are we beating a dead horse every time we bring that up? Or do you almost feel like, uh, cause it feels like a viable response to go, well, you know, he's got to stay healthy. Like if you don't mention that in your explanation of why you are identifying this person to perform at this level, like if you're picking Tyler Glasnow, like you just, like you said for Cy Young, it's like, well, I, he's my Cy Young pick. Okay, great. And if you don't throw in the caveat of, well, he needs, it's like somebody can respond to you with that. Well, you know, you, you got to remember, he's got to say, that's where we're at. That's just where we're at. But like Tyler Glasnow is another guy like Blake Snell in terms of like depth in the ball game, right? How many complete games does Tyler Glasnow have? In his career? Yeah. Uh, I would venture to guess it's in the single digits. Um, probably somewhere in below five. No, my guess is there's not a digit. He does not have one, no. Yeah, exactly. So, and this is a guy who's only hit the 120 inning mark, right? Is that the most innings? 120 that he's had in his dot, career. Yeah. 120 mm -hmm. inning mark. So, for, so I mean, 40 more innings than that is the he's eclipsed 100 mark. innings total twice. And so, if he is somebody who has talked about you know, the being predisposed based on the baseball uh, to recruiting other muscles that he didn't know he had at a time, then now we're starting to talk about a guy that you might be watching with a little, with a little closer microscope once he starts to get to the 120 inning mark, 140 inning mark. Are they thinking about manipulating that? Are they thinking about pulling back on that like how are they going to how are they going to behave but I, I i hate the fact that any of that is a part of the conversation because you just want this dude to be able to go out because i think we all go to bed at night wondering what a 33 season start 200 plus innings looks like from an arm like tyler glasnow yep that's a wet dream speaking of good pitching performances carlos rodon Couple. Someone that was absolute dog shit last year has made three starts so far this year. Mm -hmm. uh, one against the Astros, one against the defending 
National League champion Diamondbacks. And I don't know how much we can take out of this uh, Miami Marlins start last night, but it was still good. It was the the deepest he's gone into a start. Um, the Astros start was four and a third, five and a third against the D-backs. And then he went six innings, four hits, two runs. None of them earned, walked a couple and punched out six. Uh, a 172 ERA in 15 and two thirds innings to start the year with 13 strikeouts. Uh, for Carlos Rodon, this is a make or break year for him. I know he's got the security of the contract, but in terms of uh, Yankee fan forgiveness and and the leash allotted to these players when they get to the Bronx, especially on big contracts, if if you don't put up and you are uh, expected to perform when you've got a big money contract by the New York Yankees. And Garrett Cole is down to add an extra wrinkle to the expectations placed upon someone like Carlos Rodon. Uh, it is a very short leash with the patience from the media and fans alike. And uh, he's needed this start. And he's so far through three starts this year. He has performed. Uh, you're welcome. Oh, I was going to brag about him being the yeah the comeback player of the year selection on my part. Go ahead, three Jay. starts. Yeah, just no, I'm so glad you interjected there before I was able to go because uh, I am going to unleash full player hater mode. Oh, uh oh, uh, on Carlos Rodon's start because My this God. to me re- this to me reeks of like unsustainable. Not not wow. just that one set a one seven two ERA is obviously unsustainable, but like the proclamations that he's back are going to end up with a lot of people disappointed. Let me just read you a few numbers, and Please. then the two of you can draw your own conclusions, okay? Do, yeah. um, 18.8% strikeout rate. Um, his strikeout rate when he was awesome Learning was, 34, was 34.6 and 33.4, and when he was bad last season was 22.4. So it's down uh, almost four percentage points from where it was even last season. Um, he has a 10.1% walk rate. That would be his highest in a season since 2019, back when he was bad. Um, his swing and miss on both his four seamer and his slider, his two signature pitches are down from 2023. So down from last season when he was again, no good. Um, his ERA is 1.72, but his FIP is 4.57. His X FIP is 5.01. And his X ERA is 6.87. So you can sit here and say, I don't believe in FIP. I don't believe in X FIP. I don't believe in X ERA. But all of those things are pointing to one thing, which is that his current start is the definition of unsustainable. And if he doubles his ERA, he would be, I think, exceptionally lucky from this point forward. So uh, I'm not rooting against Carlos Rodon, and I'm not rooting for Dallas's picks because Lord knows you could use a win when it comes to mm-hmm. an awards pick yeah. podcast. Holy yeah. Yeah. shit. I would sit it um, out. How quickly we forgot year. my Paul Goldschmidt MVP call last year that was absolutely nailed. You're welcome. But yeah, c- continue to move on. Wait, wait, wait. That was like, h- how many years ago was that? Because uh, he didn't win last year. No, he did. That was Ronald Acuna. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, tears. <laughs> tears. That's sad. Tears. Yeah, oh, we have to dig ago. deep. Okay. All right. You got one a award year? correctly, like years and uh, so long Cy ago Young? that Cy you don't Young? even remember what it was. What'd you pick Cy Young to win the Cy Young back in the day? Is that what you're gonna claim? A couple years ago. Your, your Cy Young picks are you know likely what? if they make it out with their lives. <laughs> that's, that's, that's true. A whole story. That yeah. is a whole nother story. Yeah. If I'm a pitcher in the uh, league, it, I pay Dallas under the table to not pick me. For yeah, something. like your podcast, Dallas, is popular enough where I, I cannot having have you picking me for an award and putting that out into the ether. Yeah. So I'm I'm pretending that I'm a, a pitcher, obviously, because I'm not up for any awards yet. Yeah. 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 Dallas is cursed. Who knows what the podcasting community has in star in store for baseball is dead <laughs> in the 2024 award cycle. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I don't want to limit us. Right. That's well. Right. Dallas, uh, you know, you're an idiot for not, uh, (laughs) (laughs) 
you had a golden opportunity to come at me. I picked Trevor Story for comeback player of the year. He uh, play, probably not the. Oh, yeah. that does it. No, yeah. no, no. What no, do you no, want no, me no. to do? No. You, yeah, you want me to just absolutely bury you for that? And I mean, yeah, you're probably, coming at me. You're not coming at him. It well, uh, no, 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 can't no, do no. that. It's it. That's different. That's yeah. a different vibe. Comeback that's player that's of the year different. has like, kind of like Dallas is like, hey, like my Cy Young picture, Spencer Strider and Shane Bieber. Like that's that's where he's at. Okay, but like. Pitching is, as we've just discussed, injuries are like an understood part of pitching and Dallas cursing all of his pitchers with cursing either just complete, all of his pitchers. complete meltdowns like whatever Manoa has suffered since and just regular old fashioned injuries like Strider. Yeah, that's one thing that's part of the game. Mm-hmm. The comeback player of the year always has like a Hallmark movie vibe to it. You yeah. know, so it's like you don't want to. Trevor Story. It's yeah, I'm sad. not disparaging you know? the name of Trevor Story. No, you're disparaging. I just said my a lot name. of nice things about him. Yeah, that's well, you're, you're a fucking moron. <laughs> making the, yeah, that's not. That <laughs> has nothing to do with Trevor Story. You're right, but I just didn't feel like you know it was. Just didn't feel like it was appropriate. Whatever, pussy. Have some balls. <laughs> you know, I have respect. Mm-hmm. I have respect. Uh, These aren't just just names. Da- on the Dallas is American to. League Cy Young pick from last year. Still trying to recover from that pick. <laughs> I mean, I've. Mm. Yeah, it's a tough look. It's a um, tough look. Yeah, Not a few more lie. things. I might here. sit for, the next from a couple of people. Might, yeah. might sit the next one out. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would if I were you. Just for the, uh, that's how I'm going to help grow the game and prevent the injury cycle. Is please. I'm going to not pick awards. Please do. Oh well, we're definitely going to have to do that one on a Monday then, so we can get Joey. Yeah, yeah. If Dallas is going to sit out the awards pod next year. He has to. Um, Mike Trout has homered again. Good player. Ricky. Good player. Good player. Leads the league in home runs. He has six. Dating back to last year, he has hit 10 consecutive solo home runs. He has, uh, he hasn't doubled yet. He has six home runs, no doubles, and he's driven in eight runs because of those, uh, six solo home runs, 10 consecutive dating back to last year. Yeah. They're all flying um, over the wall of 1150 leading the league in total bases um yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna allow this conversation not that you guys want to but i'm not gonna allow this conversation to bleed into a get mike trout out of anaheim thing we're not gonna do that but just wanted to acknowledge that i feel like because of his lack of play over the last three years and because now shohei has left anaheim and left mike trout in the dust that I feel like it's it's up to us to to Keep spread the word. Hope. Yeah, well, it's up to us to like let people know that Mike Trout's still good because I feel like if we don't do that, then maybe people won't know. There's no it reason kinda, to pay attention to the Angels or Mike Trout anymore now that now that Shohei is gone and and he has opted into purgatory. Well, I th- that's the thing that and that right there, you know, it's almost like uh, it's almost like. You want to pull them back and you want to bring them back into the spotlight. But I think some fans feel like he's more than happy with not being pulled back into that spotlight. I think fans feel like he's more than happy just doing his thing the way he had been doing it before Shohei showed up and the way he's doing it now after Shohei has left. I think there's a large population of people that have made their peace with the fact that he does not want to be your face of baseball, does not want to be that dude for the industry. And I think a lot of people have moved on from the hype that surrounded him before Shohei showed up because they were met with the understanding that Trout didn't want to be that dude. And then the revelation that because of his teammate, he was no longer that dude that that conversation was reserved for somebody else now. And that conversation is still reserved for somebody else now. So I think, one, fans are totally okay with letting Mike Trout do his thing off in La La Land. And I think Mike Trout is more than okay with doing his thing in Anaheim and either being completely left alone or getting back to the point of relevance where he's as highly touted as he deserves to be and he could still give a shit less. Because he's just going to do his thing. Jay, are you exhausted by this? Uh, I'm 
I, I'm not engaging in legacy talk as we've discussed for a little while, um, but I am more than enthusiastic to engage in Mike Trout numbers talk because um, mm -hmm. it's great that he's hitting home runs. A few things stood out to me. Again, small sample size alert, so we'll see whether these things sustain, but they're very extreme, so that's why I brought them up. Um, he has the highest fly ball rate in baseball. Nobody is hitting fly balls at a more frequent rate than he is. And the difference between him and Adolis Garcia, who's number two, is uh, vast. It's, the diff it's basically the difference between Adolis Garcia and the number 10 or 11 batter in the league. So he's in his own class when it comes to hitting fly balls. Uh, that's obviously uh, going to translate to home runs. Uh, why is that interesting? Because he has the third highest launch angle in baseball, and it is a much higher launch angle than he has previously operated at in the seasons past. And Trout's never been a guy who's been afraid to lean into launch angle either. Uh, the only guys with a higher launch angle this season are Dalton Varsho and Joey Gallo. Um, another thing to watch moving forward. Obviously, those two are interrelated. Um, six lowest chase rate. So he is simply not expanding the zone. Trout's obviously been great at that in his career, but his current chase rate uh, is better than even his elite previous marks. Um, and then uh, maybe the most interesting thing to me uh, is the f percentage of pitches that he's seeing in the strike zone. Um, he's seeing a, a, about 53.5% pit, uh, of pitches in the strike zone, which is like way higher than Mike Trout has ever seen in the zone before. And that's for context, that's 33rd out of 194 qualified batters. So not at the very top of the league, but in the top sixth of the league. And maybe it's small sample. Maybe it's the pitchers that he's seen. Maybe it's the teams that he's seen. But I'm also interested to see if whether that A, changes now that he's hitting the shit out of the ball and every other swing is a home run. And B, whether that's related to the fact that nobody respects a, a, is that a lack of respect for Trout league-wide, throwing the ball in the zone way more than he previously would? Is it related to the fact that he's not chasing anything out of the zone? Are all of these things related? Is it related to the fact that like they're not afraid of anybody else? Um, like They're just willing to challenge him uh, because the rest of the Angels offense is just irrelevant, essentially. Um, I don't know. I just think it's interesting above and beyond well, the fact that he's obviously been at like the top of the league and in all stats and stuff like well, that. Well, Jay, did you look at his his O contact? I this year? Not, I did not. I mean, so you want to talk O swing second lowest of his career right now. So right. the amount he's swinging out of the zone is about as limited as it's ever been. The amount of contact he's making outside of the zone is as great as it's ever been. Almost by 20% or about 10 percentage points. He's at 80% right now, O contact rate. And his previous career high, it appears, was 70. And 17.5% O swing as it sets in 2024. And the previous lowest was 17.4%. And that was during the COVID season. Just, just screams a dude who's locked in. Well, I mean, like if he's going to expand, if he's going to expand, the bat's on the ball. Also, I mean, we kind of noted uh, in the past how I think maybe Dallas probably more so pointed this out, um, that they were very protective of Mike Trout defensively, where they positioned him defensively. And on the base paths, like we know that he's a good base runner. We know that he's fast, but Mike Trout already has two stolen bases this year. And if he steals another base, just one to get three, that'll be his highest stolen base total since 2019. He just doesn't go 2020, one stolen base, 21, two, 2022, one, 2023, two. He already has two. Why, why, uh, why is it? Do you think Dallas is he stealing bases now? Um, he can't. I think. Uh, well, you know why? Uh, like, and this is a, I don't know. He's, I, I, I think he has decided to try to get back to playing as much of the brand of baseball that I think he has wanted to be able to play his entire career. 
He's wanted to be able to play the game to an extent, the way that Bryce Harper has played the game. When we talk about a guy playing with his hair on fire, a guy who's had to be reeled in. Well, Mike Trout, in a similar fashion, was done with that defensively, right? We had him, they had him playing deeper. Go get the doubles. Do not lay out. That's not what we want to see from you. You're more valuable to us at the plate. And I think the similar conversation was had. We we don't need you trying to tear up the base path. What we need you is to be healthy and in the lineup. And what you can do offensively with the bat, I think, exceeds whatever you might be able to do for us as a team by moving up 90 feet because the guys behind you still have to get those hits. And uh, like it's it, one of the things you think about, though, is during the years where he was stealing you know, 30, 40 bags, which was two years. He led the league in runs. And I'm not saying that there's a direct correlation there, but you're moving up 90 feet. You're in scoring position. That helps to an extent. But I think there's just something about him probably wanting to get back to being a more rounded ball player. And maybe there's something to say about, you know, him being at the stage of his career he's at, still feeling healthy enough to be able to do these types of things. And he says, you know what? I'm going to do it. This is, this is what I want to get back to doing, and I'm going to do it. Yeah. It's interesting. Like the stolen bases thing. I mean, we're talking about a dude that stole 49 bases one time. <laughs> led the yeah. league in stolen bases. He led the league in stolen bases, let's call it, with 50 bags. And then out of nowhere, it was just like, I don't steal bases anymore. That's not what I do. Uh, and in a year where they made the bases bigger, which allowed runners to steal bases a little bit, it was less difficult, a slightly less difficult. Um, he stole two bases. This is a guy with 50 stolen base capability. And he played as I, I understand he wasn't completely healthy last year, but he played 82 well, games, played 82 so, so, games, stole two bases. So Jared, the last time when you look at this, the last time he got 500 at bats or more. Uh, was the last time he stole 10 or more bases. So in 2019, he, or excuse me, plate appearances. In 2019, he had 600 plate appearances and he stole 11 bags. That was the last time that he stole double-digit bases. That was also the last time he would lead the league in uh, triple slash, or excuse me, OBP or slug or OPS. But that's also when he started to experience some of the health issues. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, that's talking trout. Um, we can kind of finish up here. Uh, I asked the question, is it even worth talking about how much the Marlins suck? I think I've arrived on no. Not happy. I mean, there's going to be some changes coming. Uh, what, what happened? The restructuring of, of Schumacher's we no. contract? We said like, no. Okay. Yeah, we no. said no. Over. We said no. <laughs> no. Not interested. There's going to be so much meat on that bone. We'll get to it another day. Yeah, we'll get to no. Uh, I didn't want to close out this Dallas, pod. no. No. Yeah, no. It's a no from us. Uh, I didn't want to close out this pod without acknowledging Jay Hay. Uh, the three home runs by Shea yeah. Bangaliers. Yeah. Woo! How was uh, that? Yeah. How's that experience, Lucky. Dallas? That was nice. That was nice. It was great. Shea was there uh, before the ball game, mm -hmm. hanging out with some boys from the other side, some Baylor Bears. And uh, I think it was it was real nice because, look, this is where Shea debuted. Um, hit a bomb, threw some dudes out, and then you fast forward to this year, and he hits three bombs and throws a dude out. Like, just had a fucking fabulous game. But I also said what should be noted, uh, and I'm glad that he hit the home run, or excuse me, hit the home runs because he's done. He's done just a, uh, uh, in my opinion, having watched these first couple turns through the rotation, he's done a notably uh, a better job, I think, of just slowing the game down at times for his pitchers, which is probably not easy or maybe comfortable for him to do because. We've had a couple of veteran guys come into the rotation where young guys might be a little more like standoffish and like these guys are pretty buttoned up. They got their shit together. They got a good work plan and they go out and work. 
And so you might see young catchers hesitate to sort of interject or intervene with those guys. He hasn't been hesitant to do that, which I love to see. Um, but it was just nice that he's able to kind of do what he did offensively yesterday to uh, to bring a little more attention to the swing and A's. Swing and A's. First A's catcher to have a three home run game since Mickey Cochran 20. in 1925 <laughs> uh, when the franchise was still in Philadelphia. So uh, old Shea Bangy uh, <laughs> with a big day. Bang Huge. Leers. Huge day. Yeah. yeah. Cool. As soon as he hit uh, the third one, I knew it. How's it been working with uh, Jenny Kavnar? I know that... Um, there was a lot of uh, excited baseball fans to see that she got the gig. Uh, a lot of praise for her call for the third home run of the night for Shea Bangaliers. Uh, I know that you guys go way back. She's been awesome uh, in all of my interactions with her. How has it been in the booth with Jenny? It's been fun. It's been great. You know, and I, but I think it's a, a big, it is, it's a big advantage uh, that we have just having known each other for as long as we have and being as close as we are. Um, so that really helps because a lot of the time, you know, you're going to work with and then forming the relationship with the folks you work with. And that's not our situation. We've been friends for, you know, over a decade and now we get to work together. So it's just kind of like, man, all these conversations now come in the same place together and in a professional environment. So yeah, it's just, it's, it's really cool to go to work with your homie and call baseball games. Yeah. That is cool. Uh, Jay, hey, final thoughts today on this Wednesday? Well, you know, I just want to say I'm grateful for going to work with my homies today. Um, wow. Look at that. First and foremost. Yeah. It's, uh, I never take it for granted. Um, episode, what is it, 194? Something like that. Wow. Yep. Sure. Sure. Oh, we're almost yeah. at 200. We should do a big party for that. Yeah. Who should we have on? Fucking For, hit, um, for hitting the Mendoza line? What's that yeah. asshole's name? Ramiro Mendoza. No. Um, what's the guy's name? You know. Yeah. Mario Mendoza. No. Uh, the, Jessica the, Mendoza. The Ask me about the book guy. Oh, oh Bob Tewsbury. Bob Tewsbury. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about the book. Yeah, we should have Bob Tewsbury on for episode 200. Uh, I, and if not we Bob, have to, we should have Cheech. We get Cheech back on. <laughs> oh boy. Uh we should have uh we should clip off that Bob Tewksbury line and put it on the soundboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. not sure what the exact usage is for it, but I'm sure that's, you will find yeah. Yeah. That's the wrap it up button, is what yeah, that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the yeah, wrap let's, it up. Yeah, let's, let's talk on. about the book. Yeah. Play them <laughs> off the fucking yeah. stage. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. We have got to do that. Okay. Yes. It's yeah. priority one after we get off this. Um, <laughs> all right, my my real baseball related final thought is uh, I'm just excited to watch. Um, obviously, Jackson Holiday is going to steal the show if he debuts for real today. But uh, I'm excited to watch Jordan Hicks's third start because, um, you know, I know per, for me personally and from other quarters there was skepticism about the Giants' plan to convert him to the rotation, and he has been awesome through two starts and there was a cool article on fan graphs yesterday detailing like what exactly is different about him um and, and why this <laughs> the, the the start is sustainable or isn't what is so funny yeah fuck <laughs> i'll tell you guys after. <laughs> i'm oh, sorry all right i'll wrap it up jordan hicks looking forward to watching it 345 eastern against the washington nationals too so uh, and patrick corbin who both stink so that could be kind of a special start potentially that's wow. my final thought Dallas, uh, your final thought is to, to share with the class. Just What's to so disrespect funny? people. No, no. Uh, <laughs> I just, uh, I got a text from a former teammate who's like, oh, sweet. Cool story about Jackson Holiday. Douche. <laughs> but it's uh, <laughs> the context provided after we get off this podcast will make it funny for you. Ah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it won't for anybody listening to this. Sorry. Yeah, it's tough. Good final I thought. Know. Good final thought. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, Jake Jackson Holiday's a story. Jake yeah. Stakes. I'm just a little uncomfortable with the fact that everyone in the country is going to be tuning in to the Red Sox game to watch Jackson Holiday drag his nuts all over Fenway Park. Like, <laughs> yeah. wow. 
I think like <laughs> I, it's great for baseball and I'm rooting for him, but I'd prefer not to just be the punching bag for the next couple oh, days. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad Jake said that because that's another part of this that doesn't make sense if there was a fucking master plan by the Orioles mm-hmm. is how is this day dude not debuting at home? At home. Agreed. What are we doing? All the greats debut at Fenway. Alex Rodriguez, uh, Sammy Sosa. He will be debuting wearing number seven. It's a good number. There you go. All right, everyone. Enjoy the Jackson Holiday Big League debut tonight at Fenway Park. Uh, We'll be back here tomorrow to round out the week. Look uh, ahead to the weekend slate and uh, enjoy the game. And we'll catch you then. Bye-bye. We out.